More trouble for the embattled national chairman of the All Progressives Congress, Abdullahi Ganduje, as the candidate government anti graft agency calls press suit against him, bordering on corruption and maladministration. The International Monetary Fund reviews its projection of economic growth for Nigeria in 2024 from its projection of 3.2% amidst economic challenges bedeviling the country. Hello and welcome to Politics Today, reaching live from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nerve center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Today on the program, as we track the polity, our focus will be on what is perhaps the most anticipated political meeting right now. I'm talking about the National Executive Committee meeting of the People's Democratic Party. There appears to be that palpable anxiety among the divides who have been at war since the general election in 2023. Also, all may not be well within the all ruling, uh, the ruling all progressives Congress. Now, that's debatable with the recent wave of allegations against this chairman a top member of the National Working Committee joins us tonight to look at a range of issues uh, concerning the party and how to follow uh, through with all of them. He will provide all of the answers. But first, let's tell you that the International Monetary Fund has reviewed its projection of economic growth for Nigeria in 2024 to 3.3%. That's up from its earlier projection of 3.2%. Now, speaking during the release of the World Economic Outlook or at the IMF ongoing, IMF World Bank ongoing by... Uh, as they call it, the IMF World Bank Spring Meeting in Washington. The director of uh, research department of the fund, Olivia Gorin, uh, also projects a downward trend in the nation's inflation rate to about 23% later in the year and then 18% in 2026. Now, recall that the federal government in its 2024 budget targets 21% inflation rate, although its latest figures from the National Bureau of Statistics pegs it at about 32.33.2% in March, up from 31.7% in February. In the meantime, we can tell you that the embattled national chairman of the APC, Mr. Abdullahi Ganduje, will tomorrow, Wednesday, April the 17th, be arraigned at the Kano State High Court. Uh, that on charges of bordering on allegations of bribery, diversion, and misappropriation of funds, including the purported accept acceptance of over $400,000 and a 1.38 billion naira in bribes. All of these are allegations, by the way. Ganduje, who was the Kanu state governor between 2015 and May 2023, has been under a lot of pressure to resign his position as the APC national chairman. The situation took a new twist on Monday, with some APC executive in Ganduje's ward in Kanu suspending him and insisting that he exonerate himself of corruption charges leveled against him by the state government. However, the state executive of the party dismissed the suspension and sanctioned the ward officials that were involved in that particular suspension exercise. So it's been suspension and counter-suspension, argument over whether or not they are members of the party or what formed the quorum or not. Those answers will be provided today on the program. Meanwhile, the Kano State Anti-Corruption and Public Complaints Commission says it has filed fresh charges of corruption and what they call maladministration against former governor, National Chairman of the Party, that's the APC, Abdullahi Ganduje. There's a lot for him to answer to. According to the Chairman of the State Anti-Graft Agency, Mr. Muhuyi Magaji, the Commission is investigating the alleged transfer of 51.3 billion Naira local government funds to individuals, as well as an alleged 4 billion Naira sent from the Consolidated Revenue Account of Kanu State to an agricultural firm. Mr. Muhuyi, who has been who himself had, been, had, had earlier been suspended by the Code of Conduct Tribunal over charges relating to breach of Code of Conduct of public officers for speaking on our breakfast program, Sunrise Daily. We charge, it's about eight count charges. So the eight count charges is all bordering on allegation of uh, corruption that has to do with the state law. And it may interest you to know that before he sued us, he, he was able to, you know, in our own uh, opinion, use state resources, 240 million. And to sue the EFCC, the same EFCC, the US, uh, perhaps the camera saying 
uh, that they are the you verified that it was state resources. Yes, we verified. In fact, it will not even go on public because what is happening now is a tip of the iceberg. As I'm talking to you, we are investigating a case whereby 51.3 billion naira local government funds were directly taken from the government coffers, sent to other individuals, and we trust it to people. So we are, and this is not only the case, the case that we have piled. We have piled a series of cases, and anybody that wanted to carry his cross because. Uh, we have a case whereby one billionaire in April last year was removed from government court coffers on the, under the pressures of uh, renovating 30 roads in the metropolis, and it was taken away. Thank to Beru the change. We have a case whereby 430 million, all these cases are before the court. We have a case of four billionaire whereby it was sent from consolidated revenue account of Kanose to uh, an agricultural uh, a company. And back to what you said that, uh, yes, my hand, yes, that is the beauty of what we are doing. In Nigeria, we're not supposed to have scapegoats. We're not supposed to have those that, uh, that will be shielded. So there's a lot to answer to. Uh, these allegations are heavy and weighty. And so we see how things play out. But there has been this argument back and forth, for and against, over the issue of Abdullahi Gunduje, the national chairman of the APC. We'll explore that conversation. A member of the National Working Committee will join us on the program to explore that conversation. What's the position of the party and what's the way forward, as well as other issues that concerns the APC? But as I said, that's not all. The PDP is also in focus. In two days, there will be that meeting. There's a series of meetings beginning tomorrow, which is the caucus of stakeholders, and then the NEC meeting and the BOT meeting that will take place on Thursday. We'll look at all of that on the show today. Uh, but let's bring you your political roundup stories. President Bola Tinubu has inaugurated a steering committee on the implementation of the National Single Window Project at the State House in Abuja. In his remarks, the president described the National Single Window Project as a game changer that will revolutionize the way Nigeria conducts trade by simplifying government trade compliance through a digital platform that will unlock the doors to economic prosperity and all other opportunities. He explains that the initiative will link the ports, government agencies and key stakeholders, creating a seamless and efficient system that will facilitate trade like never before. Kaduna State House of Assembly has constituted an ad hoc committee to investigate how the $350 million World Bank loan obtained by former Governor Nasu Earl Rufai was spent, as well as other financial spendings and abandoned projects embarked upon by the immediate past administration from 2015 to 2023. The Speaker of the Assembly, Yusuf Lehman, announced the setting up of the 13-man committee during plenary on Tuesday. The constitution of the pro panel follows a motion sponsored by the Deputy Speaker, Danjuma Magaji, who drew the attention of the members about the inability of the Kaduna State Government to pay workers' salaries and discharge other obligations due to the heavy debt burden it inherited from the past administration of Nasser El Rufai. And the National Chairman of the Social Democratic Party, Mr. Shehu Gabam, is asking the National Assembly and the federal government to revisit the recent removal of subsidy on electricity in the interest of medium and small business owners. Speaking in Abuja while playing host to members of the House of Representatives elected on the platform of the party, Mr. Gabam says there is need for President Tunubu to promote policies with human face that will ameliorate the sufferings of Nigerians. Mr. Gabam also reiterates the commitment of the SDP to play its role as an opposition party through constructive criticism that will ensure good government. A civil society organization under the aegis of Kim Part Development Initiatives won the National Assembly to include electronic transmission of results through IREV in the Electoral Act. Director of the organization, Mr. Bukola Idowu, who was speaking at a multi-stakeholders meeting on youth electoral reform in Abuja, says this will further enhance transparency of election process in Nigeria. He's also asking the judiciary to set up a special electoral court which will deal with electoral matters and reduce pending cases before the court. There is a need to give the IRF a legislative backing. So far, it's promoting transparency. And so far, it's not in the electoral act, then we need to find a means of putting that in the electoral hub. Former member of the House of Representatives, Dachung Bagos, is urging the people of Plateau State to put behind them the political disagreements that have caused tensions in the state and embrace unity. Speaking at a homecoming event organized in his honor by Vyang Yutz of Plateau State, where he called for support for Governor Caleb Muftwang 
to move the state forward. And the dust raised by the suspension of the APC national chairman in Kanu State is yet to settle as concerned members of the party call for the immediate arrest and prosecution of those who announce the suspension. The APC group at a news conference in Abuja says those who suspended the national chairman are imposters and members of opposition parties who are trying to destabilize the party in Kanu State. The group calls on the Inspector General of Police and the Department of State Service to investigate and arrest those behind the alleged suspension. The 27 member ESCO are intact and had since addressed the press and disassociated themselves from the purported suspension, which is now dead at arrival. Impersonation is a criminal offense punishable by law. So those are your stories we've been tracking for you as we track the polity uh, across the country. Uh, I'm being joined in the program uh, by the APC uh, National Publicity Secretary, Mr. Felix Mokai, joins us right here in our Lagos studio. Good to see you in Lagos. Good to see you. Yes, there's a lot that's been happening in your party, and I'm happy you're here to provide all the perspective and all the answers. So, but let's naturally begin with the big elephant in the room, the purported suspension of your national chairman in his ward. And... There's been back and forth. I think yesterday also I had a conversation with the legal advisor of the state chapter of the party where that actually explained that uh, it was just two members uh, of that particular ward that were involved in that exercise out of the nine we saw. So maybe from a national working committee uh, position, what is the situation like? I know you had made a release uh, that some people are privy to. Not everybody may have seen it. Uh, I've seen part of it. So what exactly is playing now before we get to the nitty gritty of what was talked about? Uh, thank you very much for having me on your show. Um, yes, yesterday we were treated to uh, a very uh, shocking news of the suspension of our national chairman, Dr. Abdullah Umar Ganduje, from the party by members of his ward, the Ganduje ward, uh, in his local government. Um, you know, of course, as you would expect, we all rallied to... Uh, find out what was going on. But it didn't take long for us to discover that this action was, you know, simply an action orchestrated by a number of individuals, many of whom are not, you know, legitimate or card carrying members of our party in the Ganduje ward, and found that this was simply a strike something that smacked off, you know, a deliberate, you know, strike on our national chairman to embarrass him, uh, to create confusion in that ward uh, with respect to his membership of the party and, of course, naturally with respect to his, you know, chairmanship of our party. You know, if you notice, I didn't do a statement yesterday. I did it today because, you know, we needed to take the time to you know, audit that process, and even though we, at the National Working Committee, had received no communication whatsoever from the Ganduji Ward, we had to you know, take our time to meticulously investigate what was going on, and found to our chagrin that this was all the action of you know, some very devious individuals who set out to uh, you know, exactly perpetrate the outcome that we all witnessed to create you know, this national uh, concern, um, but which we now know was, um, in fact, orchestrated by certain officials who are affiliated with the ruling party in Kano, the NMPP. Um, you know, because some of the individuals who were at that news conference where that announcement was made are uh, individuals we, you know, have profiled and uh, established, are connected with certain uh, very senior leaders of the NMPP. Uh, in Kano State. So that announcement, uh, as I declare today in my statement, uh, is, you know, uh, what was in fact a criminal act and therefore of no legal effect whatsoever. So Dr. Ganduje is still the national chairman of our party and a member, a legitimate member of the party in the Ganduje ward uh, in Kano State. And therefore, uh, we hope that, you know, this will uh, hopefully rest this matter, but also just to make mm. the point that uh, our national uh, legal advisor 
has in fact fired off a petition to the IG, uh, asking the IG to, uh, requesting the IG to investigate this matter and bring not just the immediate perpetrators of this, you know, heinous act to justice, but all of those who uh, were behind them, who sponsored uh, them, uh, so to speak, uh, in, this, in this matter. Well, the reason why Nigerians were reacting, especially the, those in the political class and Nigerians will react slightly differently. First, the fact that we've seen time and again where things like this start at the world level. Yo Chayu, Adam Soshomole, uh, Uche Secondus, all of this started from world level. It started like a joke. And before you know, the person in leadership of a particular party has been booted out. Now, that's the position of the NWC. But if we take away what played out and take the position of the NWC, for instance, but the allegations they leveled against him. Isn't the party concerned about it? Because right now, th there's going to be a case in court which, which we're going to go to. They said that the people that you disown now that are not members of your party said he has a lot of corruption allegations leveled against him. So he should step aside for proper investigation to save the party from embarrassment. Isn't that a concern that you should look away, you should look at, not look away from? No, the, the, the examples you referenced mm. are examples where legitimate party members took action at the world level, properly constituted world officials, took action to you know, express themselves or you know, frame their own position in relation to whatever it was that was playing out with respect to the individuals or you know, other party leaders you mentioned. But this is not the case here. The, 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 we're dealing with a case where you know, uh, a significant a, a number of you know, Impostors, impersonators of party officials took action. So you can't credit that process with any level of you know, uh, seriousness or validity. Because if you do that, then I'm going to as well suggest that you are not a properly employed you know, staff of Channel The reason, and the, yet you're interviewing me. Mr. Monka, the reason, the yes. reason, uh, the, the, the context is different, my job here and all of that. Yes. The reason is because as we speak, uh, in fact, Abdullahi Ganduji will be arranged tomorrow in court over fresh allegations of 51 billion naira that they say transferred to individual accounts. There are issues of the dollar stuffing uh, to contractors, taking kickbacks, all of these allegations. That is the premise of my question. Given all of these allegations, is it not strong enough to tell the chairman to have a, maybe look at things a little differently? That's my question. But, I, but I, I'm sure you also are aware that on this matter itself, mm. you know, you know, we are the party. We're not, you know, members of the Kano state government. We're not part of, you know, any investigative, you know, process. They have not contacted us to apprise us of what they're doing. As far as we're concerned, we have a national chairman, okay. who is Dr. Abdullahi, you know, Omar Ganjuje. Now, if Kano state government, through their, you know, different departments and institutions, are carrying out any process. That is between them and the courts. They will go to court. And when a court is seized of a matter, you know, I mean, lesser mortars like us don't have any real say in the matter. Because the courts will do what they are constitutionally authorized to do, to adjudicate, assuming this matter is brought before them. Mm. As we speak, that is not the case. Nobody has, you know, I mean, that we know of, has formally arraigned an arraignment is a legal construct. It's not something you just spew because you can speak. A legal arraignment is a legal arraignment. There's a process, a legal, you know, I mean, constitutionally ramified process for arraigning an individual on, you know, allegations. We haven't seen that. We're not seized of that. Now, should that happen, the kind of state government will do what is they think is within their legal remit. Mm. But just to remind us in this conversation that a federal high court in this matter also made a finding and a declaration and a decision that is still valid, that has not been obtained by any, any appellate court, that the kind of state institutions the Public Complaints and Anti-Corruption mm. you know, uh, Agency, yes. does not have the authority to you know, pursue this matter any further because in the view of the court and in the judgment of the court, that is a matter that is within the remit of you know, a federal investigative authority and perhaps the federal attorney general 
to prosecute. Now, don't ask me any further questions about that. I'm simply stating what the court decided. Now, I would have thought, I'm a lawyer, by the way. I'm a senior lawyer. This is probably my 33 or 34 years at the bar. Which is why I'm going to ask you the next question. No, no, you, you may ask, and then it will be my you know, constitutional liberty <laughs> to respond to you. Now, you're here to answer questions. No, I'm here to answer questions, but not exactly. you know, every question. I mean, I, I'm also, I have a fundamental right to say, you know what, this is a question I should Land be on your thought, But you the, point, the point I'm making is that this is a matter that the you know, uh, prosecutorial authorities you know, have decided they want to pursue. But I'm also saying that a legitimate constitutional court of our land has said, you know, kind of state authorities, you may not inquire into this matter because, you know, you know, we, in our judgment, and invoking the authority of the court to say, you do not have the powers to do that. I would have thought that the kind of state, you know, governor and his, you know, agencies would first seek, if they disagree with that court, to vacate that order and, you know, meet the justice of that matter before that court, before actually, you know, firing away and saying, no, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna arraign, we're going to charge, you know, this individual with these crimes. Now, if they do that, what actually becomes of the, you know, what I consider to be the constitutional decision of the Federal High Court in this matter okay. that says that the state does not have the powers? You see, we cannot create a constitutional crisis or even a judicial crisis where judgments of the court are disregarded. Whether they cannot say the people or agree or not, it behoves on them to, you know, contest that decision right, in Mr. a higher court. Right, they Mr. haven't done that so All right, far, Mr. Moka, I'm to my to, I'm, I'm going to talk the legalese and the morality. So the legalese here is that there has been fresh charges that will be brought against Abdullah Gandujie tomorrow, and it borders on the 51 billion naira. What the court decides is another kettle of fish. Now, the one that the court has decided that, hey, Kano government, is not within your purview to pursue this. As a matter of fact, the EFCC or the Attorney General should pursue this. Doesn't it place a moral burden on the administration of Bola Tinubu, the president of Nigeria, to begin to look at this? What has this got to do with the president of Nigeria? Because it has not, the court... No, I'm sorry. No, no just, just a minute. Yes. The court says, if there is anything to answer to, as far as this issue is concerned, it is not you, Kano government, that should take him to court. It is the federal government of Nigeria. That's what I'm saying. I use the word legalese and morality. I was very deliberate. Our legal system is not run on the basis of moral precepts. It is run on the basis of, you know, codified law. Laws that are, you know, enacted by the National Assembly through time until today. You don't try an individual. Because, see, we are dealing with a potential issue of the liberty of a citizen. The Constitution of Nigeria grants every individual, you and me, and Ganduji, and everybody else, the presumption of innocence. Exactly, I agree. We are presumed to be innocent until we are charged and proven guilty. No court has proven, you know, Dr. Ganduji guilty of anything. That's first point. Second point is that beyond that, you don't taint a man with guilt until he has proven guilty, been proven guilty by, you know, before a court of law. My point is this, that suggesting that the president of the Federal Republic, President Bola Tinubu, should feel any moral obligation or burden to simply command the EFCC to, please, I must finish this point, because you asked the question, yeah. to command the EFCC to you know, investigate or indict Ganduje, the EFCC is a statutory creation. They have their mandate and they have their own rules of procedure. You know, so if and when they think, based on their investigation, that it is necessary to proceed against any individual, including Dr. Ganduje, they will do so. But to, you know, simply the way you presented it, to say, you know, look, why is the president not command? The president does not command the EFCC. I did not say. So, 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 that, so that for, for context, to investigate. I am aware. I'm enlightened enough to know that the president can. I, I assume so. Yeah, the president cannot command anyone. If you Google, Correct. if you Google, if I were Ganduje, for instance, and I'm sure you or anyone else 
when you Google, and my name is all over the place about one allegation of corruption, all the other, and all of this, I'm not going to sit still and let somebody smear my name at the end of the day. So there are two ways to go about it. There, there, there's somebody, nobody is, say, look, you know, again, Google is a, a private company owned by private investors. Miss, Mr. By, Mark, by, 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 please. Mr. Mocker, just please, a minute. You, you, made, you... you made a comment. Yes. No, no, I'm sorry. This is too important to overlook. You made a comment. You referred to Google. No president, not just in Nigeria, but anywhere in the world, would justify an action, a presidential order or directive to any agency or government to take action on the basis of, you know, information you, on Google. You are missing... I'm sorry. Mr. That, that doesn't Mr. happen. Mr. Mocker, you're, 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 maybe it, it, you understand. It won't be applied in this You're case. missing the points. Okay. Tell, I'm uh, saying that me. Abdullahi Ganduje tell me is how. a national chairman of the All Progressives Congress. That is correct. The ruling party. That is correct. Is the party not embarrassed by what is going on? It's a simple, simple, and, direct and let me, question. And, and, and let me answer you in a simple, direct fashion. The party cannot be embarrassed by what is not. The Kano State government has yet to prefer charges. They have saturated the media space with this specter of charges. They have yet to do so. You can cite on your own system now and show me the charges brought by the government. Because charges are not brought until they are before a judge. They are brought before a judge. They are read to the you know, defendant. And the defendant has the opportunity, constitutional opportunity, to actually respond, whether they are pleading guilty or not guilty to the charge. That hasn't happened. So this, everything you're saying is totally speculative. Whatever date the Canada State government has appointed may come, but it hasn't come. So look, what it's, I'm saying... It's not speculative. No, no, they, they are, I, we, I read you this story. I told you about the allegations that were brought against him. So no, the, I, I, no, 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 whether it's presented no, in court please. is a different kettle of no, fish. No, no, no. My dear brother. I, I want us to move on from the... No, no, hold, so, hang on. But land on this. I will land, land on, on this. I will land uh, on this. So it's not speculation. I will I'm saying what this. they are claiming no, against you. I am you. sorry, I disagree. Whether they defend it that or not is the not the case. Fish. Please, let me, let, me, let me respond to this. Because right. you asked the question. The Kano State government has yet to file any charges. Charges are not filed in the Ministry of Justice okay. or on the media. Charges are filed before a judge, a competent judge, presiding over a court, a case that has been you know, read by the court registrar, and then charges have, that's when you say charges are filed. No charges have been filed against Dr. Danji, as you, as you suggest. It hasn't happened yet. No, I didn't say charges were filed. So, uh, so it, that it, would not, it hasn't so happened So I get ahead of that. I did say he will be okay. arraigned. Those, those were my words. It, it, I'm very arraigned it doesn't mean he has been uh, arraigned. So, so, so we will bring me uh, back after the arraignment, after the and arraignment, I will come and discuss this. Not know, a problem. Uh, yes. You're a senior lawyer, so I can't debate the law with you. Thank I just, you. I just put the facts in front of you so you respond to them. But Thank you. Let's move on now from the issue of Gandhi. Let's move on to the issue of Plateau. Uh, I had a conversation with the Speaker of the Plateau State House of Assembly mm. and several members of your party. As a matter of fact, you have an overwhelming majority, 22 out of 24, one Labour, one YPP, who is the Speaker of the, of the State Assembly. And I was asking simple questions. Why did you inaugurate nine out of 16 and left out seven? And he made a point saying that, look, these guys, they refuse to present their CTC as well as their uh, certificate of return, given the fact that the court judgment was in their favor, knocking off the People's Democratic Party member. My question is, how hard can it be to present those papers? Or is this saying something that we're not aware of? No, the, the speaker was actually being just, I'm sorry. I, usually I'm a very polite person. But he was being utterly mischievous. I, I watched that show. And I, I saw you did a fantastic job trying to get him to actually, you know, focus on the, you know, real details of that matter. But he continued to, you know, stonewall and pursue his own agenda. Look, under the law, the clerk of the House of Assembly is the official, the public official, on whom processes, legal processes are served. Nobody... Because he's speaker today doesn't mean he's going to be speaker tomorrow. The clerk of the house is the statutory official of the House of Assembly. So once documents are served on the clerk of the house, it is served on him and everyone else who is you know, involved in that particular you know, uh, matter. These matters have been properly, legally served on the clerk of the Plateau State House of Assembly. Therefore, 
the argument that it wasn't served on him. Then I said, you know, he's the speaker. He may not be available. He may not be accessible even. Sometimes even the clerk of court may not have access to him. But the clerk of the assembly is not a political person. Mm -hmm. He's the clerk of the assembly. Therefore, he's accessible to everybody. Now, he's just being completely, you know, disingenuous in that argument. Fact is that he is deliberately, intentionally, in contempt of the court and the decision of the Court of Appeal in the matter by his refusal to inaugurate the remainder of, I acknowledge that he has not inaugurated some, but he needs to inaugurate the, you know, the entire, the judgment that you know, was the basis of the inauguration of some mm -hmm. is also the judgment that justifies the inauguration of the rest of them. So there's no reason to, you know, I mean, sort of selectively inaugurate some and leave out some. No, no, no are, you, are, you, are you saying that, because I questioned him on this particular issue yes. seriously that day, are you saying that the people involved, these seven members, whom I see that the constituencies they represent are voiceless right now in that house, which is undemocratic and should be resolved as quickly as possible. Correct. Do you think that, are, are you saying that they have the copies and he's not seen it or he's with the clerk, he's not been... How hard can it be for two simple documents to get to a clerk, to get to a speaker, to get to everybody's The hand? clerk of the house has been served with all necessary documents. You know, if you remember, he mentioned me in particular. Yes, that, he did mention you. I remember. Say that the national police say, look, you know what, I'm a lawyer. I'm a senior lawyer. This is, you know, 34 years or so at the bar. I don't, I don't play. I, I, I take the law very seriously because I was trained and I'm a professional. So when I said that he was in contempt of court, I meant every word I said. He was and remains in contempt of court until he inaugurates, he carried out his constitutional obligation to inaugurate every single member so two, of the All Progressives Congress so two, who were you know, in that, named and listed in that judgment and you know, in whose favor the judgment of the Court of Appeal was, was rendered. So, so you're a senior lawyer, so let, let, let me uh, borrow your knowledge on this one. Yes. So how is it done? Is it that the document must get to him or it mustn't get to him? You know, they, they, Purely they, illegal question. Once, once the clerk of the House of Assembly, because he is the Speaker of the House of Assembly, mm. don't forget, the Speaker of the House of Assembly is actually more or less a, you know, a, a member of the House of Assembly who is you know, first among, among equals. Exactly. But the clerk of the House of Assembly is the statutory person who bears legal responsibility for you know, what happens at the House. Because you can't pursue every member, including the Speaker, to serve documents. But the clerk has an office where you come and is properly acknowledged. Once the clerk of the House is served with you know, court documents, the Speaker is deemed to have been properly served with those documents and must carry out the dictates or the order that is, you know, contained in that, you know, decision of court. So his argument that he has not been personally served, who cares about, you know, whether he's personally served or not? That's not, you know, a, a requirement of law. He is simply, you know, saying that to deflect and to, you know, divert a, a attention from his illegality and from his complete flagrant breach of our constitution. What he needs to simply, you know, comply with the decision of the Court of Appeal. He has no right to you know, uh, challenge or, or, or stonewall. I asked him a question. I'm going to repeat the answers of what I asked him. I said, you're the Speaker of the House. What now is left? Are you not going to you know, inaugurate this guy as long, guys as long as he lasts? He said, if I inaugurate them, in his words, maybe not quoting him verbatim, he said, if I inaugurate them, yes. uh, what am I going to tell others is the premise of uh, how I'm, uh, the premise of my inaugurating them. I don't have a CTC. I don't have all these documents we're debating over. So what option is left for the party? Okay. Now, let me, let me tell you. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me respond to that. You know, a court of law is a court of law. A court of law, the authority of the, ju judicial authority of the court trumps everything else. The day that the Court of Appeal made that pronouncement, the speaker was under legal and constitutional obligation to comply. So in other words, those PDP uh, assembly members lost their right to complain by the decision of the court itself mm. on the date of that judgment. Okay. So the day after the judgment, those individuals have no right to ask the question that the speaker was suggesting that they're asking him or that they might ask him. So the speaker has absolutely no legal or moral authority 
to, you know, in any way, shape, or form, interrogate the judgment of the Court of Appeal. That judgment became effective on pronouncement. Now, okay. when a judgment gives, a court gives a decision, it may take a couple of days for the papers to be ready and served. But the effect of that judgment takes, a, you know, I mean, begins to run at the moment of pronouncement. It's not 10 hours later or 20 hours later or at the pleasure of the speaker of the Plaza House of Assembly. So he actually needs to just comply and save all of us this whole sordid, you know, episode of, you know, I mean, lawlessness and, and impunity uh, well, on his part. Well, our job is to report and provide context. We'll continue to watch you politicians play your game and play your card and within the ambits of the law. I must thank you. Mr. Felix Mocha, by the way, we don't speculate. We speak to facts. Thank and I, you. I'm sure you know that already. I, 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 can, I, can, I can work with you on that. <laughs> no worries. APC National Publicity Secretary, Mr. Felix Mocha, thank you for coming on the program. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. We're going to a quick break now. When we come back, we'll switch gears now to talk about the issues of the PDP. The neck is coming up. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Join us again. Welcome back. We're now switch gears to the People's Democratic Party National Executive Committee meeting that will be taking place the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow it will be the start of the caucus or stakeholders caucus meeting. And then the BOT as well as the NEC meeting will hold on Thursday. But there has been some level of anxiety over how things will play out. The reason is simple. There are warring camps. The camp of the Yinsun Wike, the FCT minister, and the former vice president, Atiku Abubakar. But hey. Let's find out exactly how preparations are on for that meeting. We're being joined on the program by the chairman of the PDP in Kaduna State, as well as he's the, also the chairman of the PDP uh, Chairman's Forum. Uh, is, he joins us from our Abuja studio, Mr. Hassan Hayat. Mr. Hayat, thank you so much for coming on the program, sir. Thank you very much. Good evening, viewers. Uh, maybe walk us through, uh, of course, I, I did explain uh, some of the things that will be happening. It's a busy time. You're already in Abuja ahead of these meetings that will be taking place. Uh, walk us through what is expected from this NEC meeting before we get to some nitty-gritty. Well, what is expected from the, uh, the outcome of the NEC meeting is that the PDP will come out from NEC with a unified position on how to move the party forward. Moving the party forward, the party, this next meeting, uh, according to the constitution of the People's Democratic Party, uh, if I remember correctly, one of the articles, I think 21 or so, uh, this states that uh, your party is supposed to be holding neck meetings, I think quarterly, but the last time this neck meeting held was sometime in September under your chair. And since then, we've had an acting national chairman, uh, Omar Damagong. And now there has been this uh, debate about the warring factions within the People's Democratic Party. Uh, how do you think that this is going to impact on the atmosphere of the, of the NEC meeting on Thursday and, and what resolutions is the party looking at? Yeah, you are very correct that um, since during the, the term that the national chairman, the national chairman IU was suspended. There have been no neck meeting, and uh, members have been calling for the neck meeting, and the neck meeting has now been slated for Thursday, 18th of this month. Now the issue of warring parties or factions and what you call it, certainly the anxiety uh, that was developed as a result of lack of neck meeting has made people to feel that something is not going on right with the party. But I can also say that other organs of the party have been meeting. The BOT have been meeting. The Governor's Forum have been meeting. The Forum of uh, Chairmen have been meeting. Therefore, the activities of the party really have been going on. But the issue of people talking about warring functions, let me be very specific and make it very clear. One, uh, his excellency, Atiku Abubakar Wazir Adamawa, GCON, is the leader of the party. And I don't expect people to be dragging him to be a functional leader, because by the constitution of the party, since he became the flag bearer of the party in 19, uh, 19, uh, 
2098, I mean 2018, he became the leader of the party. And he won the primaries last year, uh, became and continued as leader of the party. So I will not expect a leader of the party to be having any faction. The fact that there are different interest groups should not be looked at as faction. And I don't think Atiku would do himself any good by not coming out to dispel the idea that he is a functional leader and he has never portrayed himself as a functional leader or pronounced himself as a functional leader. But since we are politicians, anything that's going on, everybody will speak based on what he wants to be known for. And at times, we drag the names of other leaders into it. So as far as I'm concerned, and the way I see it, we will talk of function where there is really a breakdown in communications. But the party is moving and the party is consolidating. And I'm sure that when we come to the end of the meeting on Thursday, I will be proved right. The argument over whether uh, is factional or not is, is, is debatable. I'm not saying him being factional, but the party is clearly divided. Everyone can see that. Since the PDP lost election in 2015, it's not been able to recover fully as a political party. Uh, it's lost three successive elections, 2015, 2019, 2023, and things get polarized as we continue to go on. And Nigerians have been denied the opportunity of a formidable opposition. So what we have in the PDP are isolated voices, not a converge speaking as a political party, which is why we're asking this question. Is the PDP going to put this as a front burner to say we can bury the hatchet and see what we can do uh, to make sure that we stand as one political party and give Nigeria a formidable opposition that is necessary for a, a democracy like ours? Yeah, I must uh, agree with you that, you see, when we are talking of a party having lost elections and taking into consideration the environment in which we operate, you start hearing people or seeing people cross-carpeting, either for greener pastures or some, out of mischief, they say they are leaving the party. Some have even won elections and say they are leaving the party. Then you start wondering, why are they leaving the party when they have won their seats? And the simple thing is that we must accept that our democracy and the political class have not been very, very sincere to themselves and to the country because we are supposed to play this politics with convictions in what we believe in. And therefore, whether I lose today or not, I should agree that there is a tomorrow. And if there is a tomorrow, it means that I can win tomorrow. So even when PDP formed government in 1998, 1999, you see people who lost in other political parties, they rushed to PDP. That has been one of the main problems of democracy in our country. But I can assure you, and I still have that real confidence, that the parties or the interest groups, after our meeting, they will see the need to come together and forge together and make the party a viable party, a pride of everybody. There is a question everybody is asking, and I'm going to ask you one after the other. 16 lawmakers came out and said yes. they do not appreciate the leadership of Umar Damagum, that since he became acting chairman, they've lost court cases, they've lost elections. He's not been able to rally the party. In fact, they're accusing him of being in bed with the opposition in some parts of the country and all of that. Will a decision be taken on his status as the acting chairman of the party? You see, the issue of uh, Damagun, Ilya Damagun as chairman, he is acting chairman of the party. And let us not forget that there is a court case still pending that Ayu Professor Ayu went to court to challenge his suspension. And that case is yet to be determined. And as long as it has not been determined, Damagu is only in acting capacity. Now, when he is in acting capacity, as a leader, there are people who appreciate what he's doing, and there are people who feel that he's not doing enough. 
But if it's not doing enough, I always call on people. If somebody is not doing enough, what are you doing yourself to assist? Because the party does not belong to Damago, it belongs to all of us, it belongs to Nigerians, and Nigerians are looking onto PDP. So he will just sit down and say he should go. I'm not standing for him because the whole thing is that he did not contest for national chairman. Circumstances brought him to take over the leadership of the, of the national chairman uh, of the party in acting capacity, and it is still in acting capacity. If today a court order is given, or Professor Ayu withdraw his court case, it is then that there will be a vacant seat for people to now say, okay, what do we do? But for now, as long as there is that court case, Damagu as deputy national chairman North is the only person that can occupy that seat as acting national chairman. All we need to do is to rally around him, support him with advices and all that is required for him to take the party forward. And if he says that, if you ask him to resign today, is he resigning as acting national chairman and also as the deputy national chairman North or what? That means creating a vacuum. So I think all right. we, the party members, most of the party members are the leaders, are aware of this. And therefore, the issue of whether there will be any crack, real crack that will threaten the unity and the progress of the party after the Thursday meeting, I don't foresee it. So at the end of the day, uh, it has to be a serious consideration for your party, given the reputation or the, the status of your party, given the fact that these 16 lawmakers have said that it's either it goes or they leave the party. But I said two issues. The second is the weak factor, the Nyesom weak factor, the AFCT minister. Uh, some are calling for his expulsion, like, forever. They feel like it's, it's in bed with the opposition. It's a clog in the wheel of progress of the opposition party. There are so many things that are being thrown at him. Is there going to be a concrete decision as to the status of the FCT, FCT minister, Barristan Nyesom Wiki, as a member of the party? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Wiki, but I am saying that Wiki, as a member of the party, is covered by the constitution of the party. If there's anything that Wiki has done, whether it exists or imagination, all we need is to invoke the provisions of our constitution in dealing with it. Anything outside the constitution is definitely not going to help the party or help the nation. We must all realize that both within the political parties and at other fora, one of the main concerns and the problems of the country is lack of adherence to laws of the land. Once we can start learning or rather uh, discipline ourselves to accept the position of the law, whether it favors us or not, certainly the country will move forward and the political situation will improve. So if anybody is of the opinion that uh, Wiki has done something wrong that he should be punished, let there be a constitutional procedure in punishing him. It is not just you come at a meeting and say Wiki should be punished. No, there are constitutional provisions and we have to follow it. So all of this, at the end of the day, we are hoping that there will be uh, some level of outcome. But let's talk about uh, the future uh, of the People's Democratic Party. We've said they've lost three successive elections and they don't seem to, the party now, don't seem to have rallied itself strong enough. And there's an, there's an election coming. How are preparations for that particular election? You are the chairman of the, of all the chairmen of the party. So let me posit this within the confines of, uh, uh, of your status. Uh, how confident is the party that we is have, going to make we, an impressive run uh, in the next set of elections that are coming up as we round off? Uh, I will say it very simply. We have accepted that we lost because that was the pronouncement of the laws of the land, of the courts. But we know that we didn't lose elections. Uh, well, and because we I, didn't lose elections, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand we know what you're saying. that the public... You don't understand what I'm saying? I'm not, I, I'm not sure I understand. What we have you... accepted... I say we have accepted that we lost the elections by the pronouncement 
of the courts. But we believe that by the vote of the people, we won the elections. And because the people are what really determines victory, we believe that the future of the party is very, very bright. Well, we're going to see how that plays out. We needed to just check in on you to find out how you're preparing. But the facts are there. 2015, the PDP lost. 2019, the PDP lost. 2023, the PDP lost. As we speak, the House is not together from the public perception we're seeing. That's why everybody is curious to see how this battle will play out on Thursday, uh, as far as the divided camps are concerned, because apparently a lot of grandstanding happens within political ranks. But we must thank you, the chairman of PDP Kaduna State, as well as the chairman of Forum of PDP Chairman in Nigeria, Mr. Hassan Hayat, joining us from Abuja studio. Thank you very much, and thank you, listeners. We wish our country, and the party in particular, the best in the years ahead. All the best as you prepare for your next meeting. And that's it on the program. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, your usual company, I'm Jeffrey Ozama. Good night.